Let's talk about organizing data in a Databricks lake house. I don't particularly find the guidance that Databricks gives you with the bronze, silver, gold medallion architecture all that helpful. And I understand that you have a lot of choices when you organize and name things. This is specifically talking about Unity Catalog. So how would you organize your data in Unity Catalog? And just to make sure that we're all on the same page, Unity Catalog is our ability to have one organization structure for all of the data in an entire organization. And typically, you would have one meta store in the Unity Catalog per Azure subscription or AWS tenant. So you only get one Unity Catalog, and then inside there, you organize your data in catalogs and schemas and tables. And I want to share with you some ways that I find helpful to organize that data. Now, I might not be right. You know, you might find a better way, and I encourage you to tell me about your better way. And I've seen variations of this, and you know, you can act, create a lot more complexity here if you need to. But I think this will get you started in a simple way to organize data that will probably work for two thirds to three quarters of all organizations out there. Okay, so so we're on the same page. There's a traditional bronze, silver, and gold architecture. Um, so bronze is when we land data. So we get data from Kinesis or another data lake or Spark or Kafka, and we get it from Fivetran or CData or MuleSoft or whatever, right? The data lands in some type of raw format, and that's our bronze layer. It's dirty. Uh, you wouldn't really want to do analytics directly off of it. Um, it's difficult to join data back and forth. Um, it's difficult to read and understand, and it's not all consistent. So like dates might be stored in 10 different ways. Um, numbers and money and decimals might be stored in 10 different ways, right? And then as we move to the right of this diagram, the data gets cleaner and better organized. So the silver layer, this is where we create common data structures like a unified customer list or a unified employee list or a unified order list. This is where we make all the dates look the same. They all follow the same format. This is where we uh, decide on what data types will be stored. You know, we might be only storing integers or we might store some other numeric data. And then gold are business level aggregation data. So this is where we choose the granularity of the data that we're going to be storing. So we might aggregate it to the day level. Like imagine we're McDonald's and we're storing how many hamburgers that were purchased. We wouldn't store each individual hamburger because the data would be, that'd be too much to store. But we might store by hour or by day how many hamburgers we sold, where it might be a different granularity if we were you know, selling houses, right? Every house is statistically significant. So the granularity that we would store would be the actual transaction of the home that we sold, right? So we choose the granularity at the gold layer, and then we would do all sorts of different aggregations like sales by day, sales by year, sales by month, sales by quarter, or whatever we would need to do, right? Um, typically in the gold layer, we would see star schemas. We would see fact tables and dimension tables, and we would try to, uh, we, we would have a lot of different gold data structures, right? We would target a gold data structure for each purpose. We would say this data set is for finance reporting, and this data set is for sales planning, and this data set is for staffing requirements or whatever, right? So we, you would you would not want to have one data set to do everything for everybody. You'd have a lot of different data sets in the gold layer that would be targeted for a very specific purpose. And that is uh, the basic medallion architecture that um, Databricks has talked about for a really long time. Now, there are problems with it. The words bronze, silver, and gold are meaningless as it relates to data. You have to teach what those words mean to everybody who uses it. Three layers might not be enough in all cases. You might need more layers. Uh, there, I've seen as many as six or seven layers in a, in a lake house architecture before. And it's too vague and it's easy to misinterpret it. So there are better names instead of bronze, silver, gold. And you don't have to agree with me on what names to use, but let me give you some ideas. Uh, for instance, in the bronze layer, you might just call that the raw layer or the landing layer or the staging layer. And then for the silver layer, that remember silver is where we start having common data models like an employee list and a customer list. You might call that enriched or I like to call it CDM. CDM stands for common data model. 
um, or the ODS, Operational Data Store is what it's traditionally been called. But all three of those are better and better explanations and clear than just silver. And then for gold, you might call it detail or DM. DM stands for Data Mart, which is the traditional way we have of organizing uh, data warehouses and, and star schemas. You might call it curated. You might call it purposed, right? These are all like very specific. They're saying like the data in here, we care about it, we have cleaned it, and it has a very specific purpose, and we're going to um, target a very specific use case for this data um, so that when you're in there, you know why that data is organized the way it is, and you know that somebody who cared about it cleaned it and flattened it and simplified it for you. Um, now, Remember, you also want to name things according to the environment that it is in. And when I talk about environment, I'm talking about development, staging, testing, and production, right? Development where we code things, staging and testing where we share it with other people to see if they like it, and production meaning don't change this all the time because this is things that are actively being used by lots of users and they're using it all the time and we need to be careful, have a very methodical way of getting things from development all the way through the pipeline and into production so that it's being used. So you need to account for that when you name things and I'll show you a way to account for that. So remember what we're naming here, we're naming catalogs, we're naming schemas and we're naming tables. Now, the meta store exists for the entire Azure sub or AWS tenant. So you only get one of those and you don't really name it, right? The catalog is like, you know, analogous to a database. Um, although traditionally we've used schema as analogous to database, but so catalog is the big thing. You could have many catalogs. Um, schemas, you can have a lot of different schemas. And then underneath schemas, you can have all, obviously tons of tables and views, right? And we can name all those things. So here's the first bad practice, and that is putting all the tables into one schema and naming the tables dev, stage, and production, and naming the tables raw and CDM and data mart. You get these really long table names. You get thousands of tables, so it's almost impossible to figure out, you know, where the data you care about is is in, and and it's really confusing to the users. And if a developer names something incorrectly, it becomes even more challenging to figure out where things are. So I think that's a terrible practice. It's a, just very difficult for the users and the developers. Bad practice number two is failing to think about your deployment pipeline. So remember when you deploy code, you're going to target an environment as it relates to data. So you're going to target, target your dev environment or your staging environment or your production environment. If you put the word dev in your schema or in your tables, you're going to have to use variables to name those things and get it right all the time. And it becomes a lot more difficult, in my opinion. So I'm going to recommend against you putting the words dev, staging, or production in the schema or the table name. Um, I would keep the environment names to the bare minimum if you can get away with it. So that brings us to the catalog naming guidance. The actual top level thing, I think you should name those catalogs development, staging, and production. And that's it. Just name them after the environment. That's it. So that's what you're going to name the very top underneath the meta store. The next thing you can name as a catalog, just development, staging, production. And that means that you're only using variables in your deployment pipelines for only those things and only the full name, not some concatenation or amalgamation of those things. Now, can you do more things than that with your catalog? Sure, you can. And maybe you should. Um, I, again, I'm not here to say that my way is the right way. I'm just offering you some things to think about to get you started. Now, after that, we need to name the schema. And the schema is really where your organization starts to happen. So you can have 10, 20, 30, 40 different schemas. And in my opinion, those schemas should be named very carefully, which means you should not allow a developer to just name a schema without review. So everybody should decide what ske how schemas should be named. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about naming schemas in the raw layer 
that was the bronze layer in the CDM layer, which is the silver layer, and in the gold layer, uh, which which we call the data mart layer or maybe the star layer. I'll show you different names for those things in a second. OK, so in the raw layer, formerly the bronze layer, I think you should name the schema raw underscore. So again, your catalog is going to be development, staging, production, whatever you need for your different environments. You guys choose what your environments are. And underneath that, you're going to see schema, and you're probably going to see pretty much the same schema in all three catalogs, right? So for raw, you would name it raw underscore and the name of the data source that the data is landing in. So it would be raw Salesforce, raw ServiceNow, raw HubSpot, raw whatever, you know, Workday or, you know, PeopleSoft or Dynamics or whatever your data source is, right? And then inside, underneath there, you're going to have a whole bunch of tables. Those tables should look the same as they did in the original data source, meaning you should not clean or organize anything in any of your raw schemas. So the raw underscore Salesforce tables will look the way the data looks when you pulled it from the original API. And if the original API landed JSON, I think you should land it in JSON. If the original API landed CSVs, I think you should land it in CSVs. Now, there's an argument to be said, I want to see the that raw data in Delta format or Parquet format. If you need that, then just create a landing underscore for the original data in JSON and CSV, and then create, and I mistyped it here, a raw underscore for the Parquet and Delta file. So now if you said I need it in the original format and I need it in Parquet and I want it unified in Parquet so that my engineers and developers and data analysts and scientists can all look at it in a uniform method, then the only thing you should change is convert it from JSON to Delta. And that means that your landing layer will have JSON in it and your raw layer will have Delta in it. And that's fine. If you want to do that, you can do that. Um, but uh, again, having it in the original format can be really, really helpful in case there are any conversion problems between the JSON and the, and the Delta format. You would know, you'd be able to track that down through lineage and see what you did wrong and see what needed to change. Okay. So th what they used to call the silver layer, I like to call the common data model. And the reason why I like that is that common data model gives us the illusion of the adapter pattern, right? Like if the raw data is coming in in a format and star schemas are how we're ultimately consuming it in our reporting layers and in our aggregate models, then that middle model, the common data model, kind of shows that I'm just organizing the raw lightly so that I get some common structures that I can use over and over and over again um, as I adapt it toward the star schema. Now, why do we need a common data model? Well, remember, our star schemas are focused for each specific purpose. So we might have a star schema for sales and a star schema for finance. Well, the sales might have an employee list and finance might have an employee list. They're going to pull that employee list from the common data model. So they'll have one unified place for the employee list. And then the elements of the employee list that are needed for specific star schemas, we will you know, trim it down and focus it for that use uh, in the star schema layer, right? Um, in the data mart layer, whatever you choose to comment, call it. Now, you don't have to call it common data model if you don't like. I like it, but you don't have to like it. You could call it enriched or unified or ODS or operational data store, whatever you want to call it that tells you that you're doing data um, or light data organization here. And that you're, you know, you're making all the dates look the same. You're making all the numbers and money look the same. You know, you're, 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 you are doing some uniform things here so that it's clearer and cleaner. But what you should not do is put star schemas in the common data model. That would be a bad thing to do. Common data model layer should always be Delta Lake format or Parquet or whatever, just some type of big data format that uses compression and columnar indexing and that you're comfortable with and you like using. Uh, you want to do some data quality checks and type conversions. Uh, you want to document any assumptions that you've made and any transformation logic that you're making for data lineage purposes. And then the data mart layer or the star layer, um, which we used to call the gold layer, um, 
This is your curation layer. This is the layer that you're using in Power BI or in Tableau or for your data scientists, or maybe you're using it to broker data to other applications or other vendors. Maybe other people are pulling out of here. Uh, you know, you've cleaned it up and now you're giving, you know, Workday a vendor list or an employee list or something that Workday really cares about. So you've, you're, you can do that in this layer, right? In each one of the gold schemas, um, you can name it whatever you want. You can name it star underscore or curated underscore or purposed or validated or certified or data mart or mart or DM, whatever you want to name it. What you're trying to tell the user is we have curated this data. We care about it. It is clean. It is validated. And we are certifying that it is good to use and to pull numbers out of. And if you ever see a problem with it, tell us and we will fix it so that you know, you know, we care about it. Um, these schemas should only have about 10 to 25 tables in it. If you've put 100 tables in one of these schemas, it is probably too big. You, have, you, you are now no longer targeting that schema for a specific use. You are overloading it and you're having it be used by five different things. And when you have a schema be used by five different things, you have made it very difficult to change um, because that means that you have to navigate a change between all five different uses, where if instead you keep your uh, schema and your data set specific for one use, then ideally you have one stakeholder to ask if you need to change it. And one stakeholder agrees to the change and now you can change it. You've made it easier and faster to use. And because you're keeping your data marts to one single purpose, it's totally valid to say, um, we're gonna duplicate data. We're gonna put employee data in four different gold uh, or data mart layer or certified data sets uh, because they have four different purposes. So like the employee, a uh, DIM employee might be in four different star schemas, right? That's totally fair to do. Um, you could have aggregations there. You need to document any aggregation or granularity logic that you've changed. Um, and usually every table should have DIM underscore or fact underscore in front of the table, um, unless it's for like uh, application data brokering or it's for a data science curated data set. The data scientists will tell you what they want it named for. You know, they, they'll have different names. But if it's for analytics or reporting, it should probably have DIM for dimension tables and fact for fact tables. And I've made videos on how to make star schemas. Uh, you can refer to those videos for more guidance on how to do that. So that's the end of my guidance. Um, please let me know if you have any questions, and I hope this helps you get on your way on how to organize data into a Databricks data lake house. Thanks. Have a great day.